Sirs, ladies, gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak with you today on the future of fires. Um, and I think it's worth emphasizing why this is an important topic for us to address. Because irrespective of whether the future wars are hybrid or conventional, ultimately the nature of war hasn't changed. It's still about killing people and breaking things. And in across the spectrum of conflict, artillery is what kills people. Whether that's 56% of German soldiers in the First World War, or 90% of casualties in the recent conflict in Ukraine. And so we can conduct cyber operations, we conduct information operations, but ultimately if they don't enable you to deliver kinetic effects, you will lose. They're not adding value. Um, or at least you won't remain competitive unless you can still apply those effects. So I'm going to try and cover three things today. The first is some trends in technology that I think are going to reshape how fires are delivered and the effects they can have. The second, uh, I'm going to look at how that reshapes the modern battlefield, or propose how it might. And thirdly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of that for the structure uh, and concepts of operations for ground forces more widely. So, to begin with the technological trends, the first I want to highlight is range. I think it is fair to say that over the next 10 years, we can realistically expect the range of artillery to double across most systems. So that's 155 howitzers going out to 70 kilometers. That's uh, multiple launch rocket systems going out to 150 kilometers. That's tactical battlefield missiles going out to about 500 kilometers. Um, and those are technologies which are already on the cusp of deployment. There is one very important caveat to that, which is that as soon as you get beyond about 40 kilometers with any of those systems, you do need precision munitions. Uh, and the implications of that I will come back to shortly. The second technology I want to highlight is uh, automated fusion. And I'm not talking here about AI, really. It's more about the capacity of computers to take multiple different sensor streams and fuse that information. Now, if we think about the Gulf War in 1991, that the precision that was enabled in the Gulf War relied on a combined air operations center in Riyadh, which had you know, over 1,000 analysts working in it. Um, if we think about the precision that was uh, achieved in Afghanistan by U.S. forces during, you know, network-enabled warfare, um, Task Force Striker in Kandahar Air Force Base, which is where they uh, maintained their tactical headquarters, supposedly tactical, had a uh, targeting cell of over 200 people. And in any major conflict, a tactical headquarters of over 200 people is not going to last very long. So that method is not very viable. But the reality is, is that you don't need uh, something of that size anymore because increasingly our computers are able through edge processing and other cap techniques to significantly reduce the human burden of analysis. Um, I'll use a couple of illustrative examples. If we think about Fireweaver as a, as a system, Fireweaver uh, is developed by Raphael, and what it allows you to do is, as a recon officer or, or reconnaissance troop, you can take a picture, and you can select a pixel on that picture. You then send back the uh, picture, indicating what the target is, to the command post. That is automatically fed into the system. There's no human and looking at the picture at that point. And what the system will do is it will integrate that image in the vertical plane into other images that might be available to the headquarters at that time, or uh, a satellite image in the horizontal plane. And so what you produce from simply taking a picture and selecting a pixel is a point on grid squares uh, and a real-time, essentially, um, image of the target, which can then have attached to it, because the uh, computer will quite easily identify what the target is. Military vehicles are quite distinct. You can attach the IR signature and other signature uh, components of that target. Let's say it's a T90. And at that point, that can then be passed to your munition, and you have your range, location, etc. Um, all that's needed from the command post is the decision as to whether or not you engage the target, whether it's worth the munition, and whether it's worth revealing the position of that munition. Now, something that's really important here is that that doesn't just enable precision effects. It also enables conventional artillery, legacy artillery, to become highly effective. Um, the chief, in his opening address yesterday, mentioned the rocket attack in Zelopinje in um, Ukraine. It's worth noting how that occurred. 
So the first thing is that the Russians detected that there were two battalions trying to link up uh, in eastern Ukraine, about 10 kilometers from the Russian border. Uh, they were maneuvering and communicating with each other. So electronic warfare units detected the movement. The second thing was that the Russians applied jamming, mainly through UAVs, and this knocked out the military radios of those vehicles. So what did the crews do? Well, two mechanized formations, a lot of them got out of their vehicles or opened the hatches and started shouting at each other, so they bunched up. Uh, and quite a lot of them put on their phones so that they could communicate to the other formation and started communicating through WhatsApp. So what the Russians did is they had already sabotaged the uh, towers, the cell phone towers in the area. But what they had is they had an Orland Yesit UAV, so a, a drone with a Lear 3 package on it, which essentially mimics uh, a cell phone mast over these formations. Have three of those, all the cell phones in the area suddenly link up to it. And what you have is the triangulated position of every single cell phone in that set of grid squares which gives you the concentration of the forces. They also had some uh, live feeds coming in from UAVs, fairly cheap ones. Ten minutes after those UAVs were noticed by the formation, the firing started. And they were, those two formations were hit by 40 salvos of BM-21 mainly uh, rockets. So not a highly capable, accurate system, but a kill chain which was robust, had multiple layers of um, redundancy in it, and enabled a very, very quick and effective engagement so that those two formations were rendered combat ineffective in about 20 minutes. So, that's if you're using conventional munitions. But the third technology I want to highlight is multi-sensor active seeker munitions. Um, so, we've had sensor-fused munitions and this kind of thing for a long time. A lot of those have been a uh, single input that is actually inside the munition, and the, usually there's a requirement for a control link going back to the, the firing post. Um, what we're seeing now is highly capable active seekers. And so the munition itself, if it is given this grid square, there is a T90 somewhere in that grid square. Look for the uh, IR uh, visuals, so electro-optical, um, radio frequency, various other things, components that make up a T90 in that area and hit it. Uh, and quite reliably, those munitions will hit those targets. And what this does is it completely transforms the timeline on targeting. Because rather than having to have a live feed from your uh, forward post, or for the target to be static, and therefore you know, there's only limited points at which you can apply the effect, instead, that target might be moving through an area tactically, therefore quite slowly. And all you need from your observer, your recon team, is that one piece of information which says it's in that grid square. right? The active seekers then fired, having gone through the fusion system, uh, and it will scan that area and strike the target. Now, there is a risk that it will hit a different target, say the other T90 in the pair, um, but realistically you're probably firing a cup of munitions. The fidelity of the sensors on those munitions is very high, uh, and increasingly they are able to engage moving targets in complex terrain. Another thing to point out there, whereas, let's say, electro-optical munitions uh, in the past would have been very uh, less precise, shall we say, or even unusable in environments where there was high density of cloud. Um, spice, for example, the uh, Israeli munition is much harder to use if uh, visibility is above about 700 meters. Um, but if you have multiple sensors, then you can actually get around a lot of those problems. And so the reliability of that capability increases as well. And the fourth technological trend that I want to address is defensive measures. Because in the past we've had CRAM, uh, you know, rotary cannon that can engage incoming munitions, but they run out of ammunition very quickly. What we're seeing now is high energy lasers being able to do that. Uh, not in all you know, terrain or fog or snow, they're less effective, but they are able to engage incoming munitions. There's BMD capabilities like Iron Dome that are being developed, and as they are rolled out and used in greater quantities, the costs are also coming down, the technology is maturing. There are things like high-frequency microwaves, which, okay, are limited in terms of their range, but can engage multiple uh, incoming munitions simultaneously, and so don't suffer from the same saturation issues as other types of defensive systems. And then, of course, there's the traditional forms of deception. And the thing I'm trying to get at here is that as the number of defensive capabilities against fires increases, what you have is you have layered defense, which means that even if you can't stop everything, if you are facing precision strikes, you can increase the cost very substantially of your opponent reliably being able to engage those targets in a limited area. 
because you have to actually have all of those layers in place. Most of those systems are uh, designed to engage a very specific kind of target. So, four trends in technology. What does that actually mean on the battlefield? And here we have to come back to that gap at about 40 kilometers between conventional munitions and precision. Because most of those precision munitions that I've mentioned are going to cost you, at a minimum, if we're talking artillery shells, $70,000 a shot. Uh, and if we're talking missiles, then it could easily be you know, $300,000, even a little more. Uh, and if we're talking tactical missiles, then we're probably looking in the range of $800,000 per fire. And so you are not, no force is going to have enough of those to systematically engage an adversary. You have to be selective about how you apply them. Um, conventional fires still matter. And if you do not have uh, a significant conventional fires capability, you can simply be overwhelmed. But what this sets up is an interesting challenge, because if at 40 kilometers I can engage you with massed conventional artillery while you're maneuvering, and given the density of sensors on the modern battlefield, it would be very surprising if you could maneuver into that space with armored vehicles without being detected. There's still 30 kilometers beyond that where I have significant levels of precision munitions that can engage you, but I only have a limited stockpile of them. And the challenge for forces is how do you cross that 30 kilometer gap and get into the 40 kilometer conventional space without losing your critical enablers, whether that be your bridging equipment, whether that be your main battle tanks so that your infantry fighting vehicles suddenly are looking very vulnerable, uh, how are you actually going to cross that space without being decisively engaged? And this brings us into how this reshapes the modern battlefield, because there are some things you can't protect. You're not going to, you know, all artillery, all warfare relies on logistics. Realistically, um, the British Army with the strike concept has done a lot of work on how you can reduce your uh, logistics footprint at the tactical level, but at the operational level, you're still looking at large depots. You're still looking at concentration of munitions and material. Um, and so, Really, that creates a fixed point that you have to defend. That is also going to fix most of your defensive capabilities, if you have them. Um, and therefore, what we can envisage is almost defensive nodes, where it's not that precision munitions couldn't do significant damage to them, but if your opponent tries to overwhelm them with a limited number of precision munitions, what they're going to do is they're going to exhaust their stockpile, at which point you can move into that 30 kilometer space and start engaging them as you wish, and they're not going to be able to fire back reliably or with the same level of effect. And so if you envisage those protected nodes, probably in, in urban areas because they're more defensible, there's better camouflage, there's better logistic links, about 70 kilometers away from one another or a little further, then we can also envisage a essentially contested zone in the center where both sides are equally under threat from each other's conventional artillery and this 30 kilometer gap around there between the forces where you have to maneuver through that space. Um, and we can also envisage the primary task at the onset of conflict not necessarily being uh, con heavy contact between maneuver elements, but rather pushing into that space with relatively small force packages and recce forces, UAVs, uh, significant numbers of potentially autonomous systems, and essentially trying to map out the enemy's sensor screen for their reconnaissance strike complex, as the Russians would call it, so that you can start attriting those sensors. Now, it's worth being very clear about the consequences if you do not attrit those sensors. Um, I don't know whether you've been following the recent developments over last, the last weekend in Idlib, but after a airstrike killed uh, 33 Turkish soldiers in a command post, the Turks essentially unleashed uh, a precision fires arsenal on uh, Syrian army forces, mainly enabled by Biaktir UAVs. Uh, and low estimates at the moment, but you're looking over 100 Syrian army dead uh, and in, in about 48 hours, combined with dozens of armored vehicles destroyed. Um, so interestingly, the Bayaktir doesn't carry, the Mamel munition that it carries wasn't able to penetrate some of the T-90s that they fired upon um, and T-72s. So there are a few instances that I've seen in footage where the tank has survived the hit, but in the vast majority of cases, uh, infantry fighting vehicles, logistics vehicles, artillery pieces are destroyed. And they're also, it's not, you know, we can, we can be flippant about the competence of the Syrian army in their vehicle handling skills, but testing in the US and UK has concluded very much the same thing. 
against our own vehicles, which is that UAVs will find armoured vehicles, even when they're in wood blocks, because you cut very, very distinct curves and ruts in the terrain, which aren't obvious from an observer at ground level, but as soon as you are in the air, are very dis and can loiter, which fast air can't, you are very distinct. Um, and so you will be found and you will be engaged. So what does this mean for uh, our conventional forces? Well, if we think about a traditional armoured assault, you know, the, the kind of standard line of six kilometre wide frontage, 15 kilometres of depth, trying to break through the front line. The first thing is that if, we're, if our logistics chain is about 70 kilometres away from the fighting edge, or 35 kilometres away from the meeting point, then there isn't exactly a front line. Uh, there, there is a front line of control, but there's a large no man's land, you could call it, in between. And so you're more likely to be pushing in and trying to sense and detect one another in that space and potentially mutually penetrate. You may well be engaged at an unexpected angle because you've passed someone. We've already seen this in Ukraine where forces managed to achieve about 200 kilometers of mutual penetration at times um, in 2014-15, not since the Minsk agreement, obviously. And so your force packages need to become much smaller. They need to be able to send back uh, those images for fusion to enable those fires and effects. They need significant lethality because if you are smaller and you don't have immediate recourse to a massive formation, then you can't necessarily absorb casualties and you can quite easily be fixed. So speed of engagement in those meeting engagements, probably quite unexpected meeting engagements, will be critical. And another component is that those elements have to have shorad capability, short-range air defense capability. If they don't, then you will suffer the same uh, attrition rate that the Syrians have experienced. Um, so we can, we can debate about, you know, main battle tanks are certainly going to cut through a formation once they get there, but if they have to traverse 70 kilometers to, become, to get into the direct fire zone, then are they going to be able to get there with their supporting infantry? So... I'll round out there. Um, I'd make one last point just to be controversial, which is on hypersonics. The hypersonic capability, um, you're not going to have many of them because they're very expensive. The critical thing is that all of a sudden core headquarters, logistics hubs are in range and they're going to come in at a speed that will give you no time to react, which means that the real threat from hypersonics probably isn't in a war fighting context where everyone's been fighting for a while and a lot of those capabilities are expended, but rather if you're in a sub-threshold context, let's say you know, we have a hybrid fight going on in Ukraine and a large NATO force deploys for deterrent purposes, sets up its headquarters, etc. Now the footing of those troops will probably not be we're war fighting and following all of our skills and drills of maneuver at which point your core headquarters, some of your assets, might well become quite fixed, your logistics hubs and airfields. But if the adversary decides to suddenly switch and go into high-intensity conflict, their first strike is probably not going to be opening up with conventional artillery on the front. It could well be a hypersonic threat, which will come with virtually no warning, and could knock out your higher echelon capabilities. So one of the critical questions that we have to ask under that threat is, given that almost all of the battlefield is held at risk. How do we operate in a way that doesn't present our adversaries with opportunities that they can't resist? Uh, and with that question, I will hand back to the chair. Thank you.